it fair that Eli Manning and Peyton Manning, both NFL quarterbacks, both Super Bowl winners, had as their father Archie Manning, who was himself an NFL quarterback? Is it fair that Patrick Mahomes' father was a professional baseball player, and so his son inherited, obviously, a lot of his athletic gifts, and on top of that, has been able to see, since he was a young kid, what it requires to be a professional athlete? That seems like kind of an incredible advantage if you want to be a professional athlete, is if one of your parents is a professional athlete. So that's always a huge advantage. And there are all sorts of ways that parents advantage, perhaps disadvantage their kids, the neighborhood you grew up in, the country you were raised in. There's all sorts of things that advantage people or disadvantage people. There's once kind of a cheeky title of an Economist magazine on the front, it just declared, choose your parents wisely. Because who your parents are has a huge impact on your life. But of course, we don't get to choose our parents. It's chosen for us. The point is that we can be advantaged or disadvantaged in all sorts of ways. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, and when it comes to being in the family of God, Jesus gives a different criteria. And in the gospel today, Jesus says, his mother and his brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd seated around him told him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. And maybe they were thinking, ah, if only I could have been born as being somehow close to Jesus, either from his hometown or be somehow related to him. But I wasn't. But Jesus, those people that are particularly close to you, they're outside waiting for you. But Jesus goes on to say, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those seated in this circle, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Now, I have to make two clarifications. The first is, the Bible sometimes speaks of the brothers of Jesus, and as Catholics, we might think, ooh, well, don't we teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin, so how could Jesus have brothers? Isn't that kind of a problem? And there's an expression in the Bible, it's a, it's a Hebrew expression, which then gets translated into the Greek, which means close relative, which sometimes means brother, but it has a wider meaning than our word for brother. It can also be a nephew, it can also be an uncle, it can also be a cousin. And this is what the Catechism says very clearly, as protecting the perpetual virginity of Mary. It says, against this doctrine, the objection is sometimes raised that the Bible mentions brothers and sisters of Jesus. The church has always understood these passages as not referring to other children of the Virgin Mary. In fact, James and Joseph, brothers of Jesus, so in Matthew 13, it tells us that James and Joseph are the brothers of Jesus, are the sons of another Mary, a disciple of Christ, whom St. Matthew significantly calls the other Mary. So in Matthew 27, we find out who the mother of James and Joseph are, and Matthew calls them the other Mary which clearly he's not referring to the Virgin Mary. He would never refer to the Virgin Mary as the other Mary. She's the star Mary. <laughs> he's the other Mary. In other words, they may be cousins or they may just be, have a close relation in some other way. So that's the point. Though, although the Bible uses this expression, in the biblical language, that can have a broader meaning than just the blood brothers of someone. And then secondly, uh, I just have to say a word about the Bible refers to the unforgivable sin. And I feel like people are asked, Father, what's the unforgivable sin? Not a lot of people will read a book called Five Ways to Improve Your Life. Somebody might read that book. But there's another book called Three Ways to Absolutely Destroy Your Life. Like, I might read that book just to make sure I'm not doing those three things, you know? And so what is the unforgivable sin? Well, John Paul II once wrote a document on the Holy Spirit. And in it, he said that sometimes people can develop such a hardness of heart that they will no longer allow God in to save them. In other words, the unforgivable sin is the sin we're not willing to ask forgiveness for. One of the sins against hope is despair, to think that I can never be saved. And so then I stop trying to be saved. I stop trying even opening myself to the grace of God. And so that would be the unforgivable sin, is that uh, I close myself off totally to the grace of God and not allow Jesus to save me. Okay. So back to Jesus' line. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. That's it. And I'm always struck by how accessible holiness is. Anyone can pray. Anyone can fast. 
Anyone can serve others. Anyone can grow in virtue. Anybody can learn more about the faith. Anyone can read scripture. Anyone can do good. These are things that are totally accessible to any person, and they have no bearing, or they're not affected at all by who your parents are, or the family you're raised in, or what country you were born in, so on and so forth. Anyone can be holy, because anyone can serve and love God. That's available to any person. All the spiritual masters of our tradition said that we have everything we need right now in our life to have true joy, because we have everything in our life right now to be holy, to become a saint. And that's what Jesus is saying. Who is my mother, my sister, my brothers? Whoever does the will of God is my mother and my sister and my brothers. And Jesus is creator. He created everything out of nothing. He's the savior. He saves us. And he's also our judge. And at the end of our life, we of course be judged by him. And we live in a time, especially with the internet, social media, where we can be hyper aware of what other people think about us. What do I mean? I can post a picture on the internet, and within like eight seconds, I can be getting responses. I like it, like it, like it, like it, like it, like it. Yeah! I've got 37 likes in eight minutes! Come on, right? I can just, one, I have one like down third word thumb, it's like, what, what's wrong with the picture? What don't you like about it, right? So we can be hyper aware of what other people think about us. But at the end of the day, when we die, we meet Jesus, and so there's really only one person who sh we should really care about, and that is whether this worships God, whether God is glorified by this. Jesus, is this what you want me to do? Those are the only questions that really matter, because his opinion is truth. It's the only opinion that ultimately matters. And the virtue that I'm talking about is some combination of both obedience and fear of the Lord. Obedience comes from two Latin words, meaning audire, which means to hear, and the, the other word is ob, which means like right next to. So to be obedient is to, to be very intently listening to the other. And the perfect example of this is when Mary says in John chapter 2 to the servers at the wedding feast at Cana, she says, do whatever he tells you, referring to Jesus. And to do whatever Jesus tells you, you have to first be listening to what he tells you, and then you have to do it. And that's what obedience is. Our fear of the Lord is that I have a, a fear of sinning, of offending God. And as Thomas Aquinas says, it's a filial fear, not a servile fear. Servile is born out of dread of punishment. I don't want to sin because God's going to punish me. Sir, a filial fear is I don't want to sin because I don't want to offend God. It's like he's so good, he's so loving to me that I don't want to do anything to offend him. I want my life to be pleasing to him. I want him to, to make me good. And so that's what... Um, fear of the Lord is. And it's such a radically important virtue, and we live in a time where people don't have this beautiful fear of the Lord. They care so much about what other people think, except for the Lord, which is the only one who really, we should ultimately care who thinks about what we're doing. And I've seen when one person has this beautiful gift of obedience or fear of the Lord, how they can change whole situations. And I'll give you an example from a psychological experiment. They did an experiment. They got a bunch of people in a room, like, like a dozen. And they showed them two lines. Line A is long, and line B is short. And they go around the room, and they ask the people, are the lines the same length, or is one of them longer than the other? And everyone in the room is a paid actor except for one person. And they all say, same, 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 same. And the line is like this and like this. And the, the, the guy at the end is like, like, what? So finally it gets to him, and do you know what they would say the, the great majority of the time? The same. The same. Like, that, I mean, I, that's clearly, like, significantly longer, but, but everyone is just the pressure of the room, same. They rerun the experiment. This time, same, 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 but they only have one other person in the room say, line A is shorter than line B. Same, 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 same. And then when we get to this person, his likelihood of saying one line is longer is now dramatically bigger. Because, oh, I'm not crazy. One other person agrees with me that those lines are not the same length. In moral situations, when the truth is being attacked, whether somebody, by, their, by what they do or by what they say, if a person has the courage to stand for truth, to be obedient, to have this beautiful fear of the Lord, 
it reminds everyone else in the room, oh yeah, I should care about what God thinks. I should care about the truth. That's the ultimate uh, point of my life. That's whose opinion ultimately matters. And so friends, there are so many things in our life that we do not have control over, that are just given to us. But what Jesus is saying today is that God became our father through baptism, and we become closer to him through obedience and love. That is something totally in our control. That in every situation we're in, God is with us, and he's for us, and we can be obedient to him. 